10 years ago, very few of us would have heard the terms transgender or transsexual. Back then, very much out of the public eye, a very small group of vulnerable people were being treated for gender dysphoria, this feeling of a mismatch between perceived gender and biological reality. Today, it's one of the biggest social and moral debates in the country. The media, by and large, promotes it, and multinational businesses are falling over one another in their bid to appear the most progressive, the most affirming. This idea that it's possible to be born in the wrong body or to change sex or even to be neither sex, where has it come from? To explore this today, I'm joined by Dr. Sharon James, the author of Gender Ideology, What Do Christians Need to Know? And Michael Taylor, a researcher specialising in gender ideology here at the Christian Institute. Thank you both for joining me. Well, this is a huge issue, but perhaps we can start by talking about two separate phenomena, those who attempt to change sex as an adult and those who try to do so as a child. Yes, well, the thing about that term gender dysphoria which is that it's really a bit of an umbrella term which I think often obscures the differences between several different conditions. So broadly speaking, then, you have those very young children, often boys, who from an early age strongly associate with the opposite sex. They might insist that they're a girl, for example, um, and that they dress like a girl and be referred to by a girl's name. And all the research shows that in 60 to 90 percent of cases, uh, those feelings will resolve before or during puberty, providing the child isn't then put on a course of puberty blocking treatment. So that's one group. Uh, the other group you mentioned just there are the older males. Uh, and for many, not all, but for many of them, the desire to be the opposite sex seems to have its roots in uh, sexual or strong romantic desire. So there's a, there's a profound uh, erotic attraction to the idea of being their female, sen their female self. Now, for obvious reasons, that's quite an unpopular thing to say, but the fact of the matter is that many older transsexuals will openly say that that's their experience. So we're dealing with a distinct phenomena, um, and that's not even mentioning the growing number of adolescent girls that I know we'll be talking about uh, in a moment, the so-called rapid onset gender dysphoria phenomenon. And then there's obviously um, many people who don't fit into either of those categories. But yes, the point is gender dysphoria isn't uh, one issue. It's also quickly worth saying and this is a distinct issue to those who are born with an intersex condition. That's the uh, extremely rare case where we're dealing with a range of biological anomalies. Uh, transgender people, by and large, biologically normal in that sense, and the, sh the two things shouldn't be confused. Mm. Uh, so this adult group that you've mentioned, uh, and you've said that they are, uh, by and large, mostly male, uh, it's actually quite a small group of people, isn't it? and yet it seems as though these vulnerable, uh, quite confused people are being used to dramatically reshape society for, for everyone. I'd jump in there and say yes indeed, and also that activists within international bodies are promoting the theory that says that we all have something called a gender identity, which is independent of our biological sex. There's no scientific evidence to support this theory, and yet it's being embedded in our legal system and often promoted in our schools. So one indication of the desire to reshape society for everyone is the sheer number of storybooks recently produced aimed at very young children which promote the idea that they can choose their gender. The Gender Fairy, for example, is a picture book written for little four-year-olds and it tells the children, only you know whether you are a boy or a girl. No one else can tell you. So there are these people who are really trying to promote uh, gender ideology to make it the norm in society. And one of the lines that seems to come up again and again is suicide. And the argument goes that if we don't all collectively, as a society, affirm everyone who believes they're of the opposite gender, then we are failing them. Uh, we're putting their mental health at risk and then they will commit suicide. That's how the, the messaging goes. And that same messaging is being leveled at parents when their children uh, or their child expresses even the slightest doubt about their gender, you must affirm or they will try to kill themselves. Yes, well obviously this is a very sensitive topic and we need to tread carefully as always. Um, and to be clear, we're talking about self-reported suicide attempts or ideation, which is a different phenomenon uh, to suicide itself. Uh, but a few things to say then. Do gender-confused 
teenagers and adults experience higher rates of mental illness than the general population? Yes, and that's something we always must be mindful of. Uh, however, just a few things. Is the research into suicide attempts limited? Yes, very much so, and for lots of reasons. Just one example of this. Um, the participants in most of these studies are not randomly selected. They're self-selected, which means then that trans people who have experienced the most difficulties in life are probably more likely to enter, enter those studies in the first place. The second thing to say is that there is actually very little evidence that treatment in the long term is helpful at all. In fact, other studies show that suicidality is actually worse after sex change treatment than before. Um, in fact, preliminary results from the Tavistock clinic themselves actually found that after a year of using puberty blockers, there was a significant increase in those who said that they deliberately tried to hurt or kill themselves and that the suppression of puberty didn't impact positively on the experience of gender dysphoria and that girls were actually more dissatisfied with their bodies before treatment, uh, sorry, after treatment than before. So it's, a, it's an area where much care is needed and sadly activists have twisted a handful of studies to effectively blackmail parents into pushing children down this path. Mm. It's quite a sad state of affairs really. Um, Sharon, you've just released a new book I mentioned earlier, Gender Ideology, What Do Christians Need to Know? Can you tell us briefly why you felt driven to write that and, and what are some of the things that you cover in that book? Yes, well as Christians we rightly want to affirm and treat every single human being with dignity. And that's because every human being has been created in God's image. And of course, we're to love our neighbor and treat everyone with kindness and respect and compassion. But what does real respect and compassion look like? Does it mean that we have to endorse everything a person claims about themselves? What if their claim is based on a lie? Many people suffering gender confusion are effectively victims of the false ideology, gender theory. And we need to make a clear distinction between trans activists who are promoting that ideology from people who are suffering gender confusion. And those who are suffering may not themselves want to promote gender ideology, but they are victims of it. And if we're going to help them, we need to have a clear understanding of what gender ideology actually is. And that's why I wrote this book. Gender ideology, what do Christians need to know, explains in simple terms what is going on as well as explaining what gender ideology is, I describe why it has arisen and I look at how it has been promoted and I especially look at the impact on children. And my aim in writing it was to help Christians to be more confident in the truth that we have been created male or female. And I want us all to be better equipped to protect the next generation from believing lies that lead to lasting physical and emotional harm. In one section of the book you talk about how parents can help their children respond uh, in a gender fluid culture. Yes, I think as parents we can really help our children to be prepared by teaching them about God's good design. And we need to encourage children and young people to respect their bodies as we are all created by God. You know, we live in an age which puts really cruel pressure on young people to focus on how they look but we need to reassure our children that each one of them is special to God and our value and dignity doesn't rest on how other people judge our appearance. Of course, it's important to teach our children that everyone should be treated kindly, no matter how they behave or what they believe. But equally, we must teach our children that we shouldn't be forced to agree with the beliefs or actions of others. Disagreement is not hatred. Of course, all bullying is wrong. But that also means that our religious or con conscientious beliefs should be respected by others. I think we can especially help children by avoiding exaggerated stereotypes of masculinity and femininity mm. because all our children are different and they have different aptitudes and gifts which should all be encouraged and nurtured even if they're not stereotypically male or female. We should make sure ourselves that we're aware of what children are learning at school and at the appropriate stage, we can help our children and young people to be critical of the claims of gender ideology. We could chat through with them questions such as, do we really have to accept what people think in their minds that they are? How far does that go? What about age? What about race? And so forth. So parents need to be really quite engaged and, uh, and looking into these yes. issues and really taking yeah. um, quite a proactive Absolutely. steps. Absolutely, be proactive. Mm. 
Uh, well, I'm sure there's much more that we could say on that. Um, but I do want to focus now on uh, that phenomenon we were talking about earlier of children and, uh, and how they are being exposed to this. Uh, Michael, you mentioned a little bit earlier about uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria. Uh, but how is, how is it that children and young people are being exposed to gender ideology in the first place? Yeah, well, uh, Sharon's obviously just mentioned the growing promotion of gender ideology uh, in schools. Um, though obviously that's a, a relatively recent thing. And for many teenagers, I think their first serious interaction with these ideas comes through peer groups and through uh, on online and through social media. So just a cursory glance at social media sites like Tumblr or YouTube or TikTok will reveal mountains of very troubling material, a constant stream of posts and videos glorifying the gender transition process, memes, artwork, comics, in-jokes, uh, many of them making light of irreversible medication and surgery, uh, and many which are just very genuine and agonised cries for help, uh, but all of this is contributing to a very dangerous ecosystem which normalises the claims of gender ideology and demonises anyone who disagrees. And of course this stuff then gets circulated in the offline world as well, uh, in teenage peer groups and in the playground and in LGBT support groups. I find some of the arguments made by trans activists can be often quite contradictory at times. Uh, at times agenda is fluid, it's on a spectrum, but then at other times it's innate, it's fixed, and it's the body that has to be changed to match the gender. And of course, uh, these same activists would absolutely deny any suggestion that gender dysphoria could be a trend, that teenage girls in particular might decide to identify as boys uh, in order to fit in. Uh, you mentioned peer groups before there as well. And there is, there is some research there uh, which suggests that that might sometimes be the case, isn't there? Yeah, well, last year there was a study written by an academic at Brown University in the States, a lady called Li Lisa Lippman. And she was really just looking into uh, the accounts of parents who say that their children uh, in adolescence have suddenly identified as transgender. Uh, and the study looks at the role of social media and the phenomenon of clustering, uh, where a person with transgender friends will also claim to be trans as well. I do think we have to be careful when we describe transgender tra transgenderism as a trend, though. Um, yes, there is something unusual going on among young, young people, particularly teenage girls. Uh, and you can see that in the 3,000 plus percent increase in young people being referred to Tavistock's gender clinic in the last decade, uh, nearly 75% of which are now girls. So there's clearly some kind of phenomenon going on. But that doesn't mean that these girls who, ident who are identifying as trans are doing that because it's just, just because it's trendy. Um, these are people who are clearly extremely distressed, distressed about their female bodies, distressed about being perceived as female, uh, and desperate for many of them to become males. So the question is, where are these feelings coming from? And what Lippmann's paper surmises, uh, and what many ex-transgender people will tell you, is that there is some kind of social contagion at work. So that's to say that there is a wealth of advice encouraging people to understand their normal ad adolescent struggles through the lens of gender dysphoria. And once the seeds are planted in the mind that a person might have dysphoria, that discontent of theirs is exacerbated to the point where young, confused girls do start to exhibit real distress at their bodies uh, and have become absolutely convinced that medical treatment is the solution. And such people then become the spokespeople of that mode of thinking. We should probably talk a little bit about uh, detransitioning too, because uh, that is increasingly making the news. Uh, these people who transitioned from one sex to the other or decided uh, to be non-binary or to be gender fluid, but now they're returning to their birth sex. Yeah, well, we don't know an awful lot about these people. Um, a couple of years ago, a British study into, de into de detransitioning was blocked due to worries that it would be thought of as politically incorrect. Uh, and detransitioners likewise seem to be on the receiving end of much abuse from the trans activists too. But we do know that there's a growing number of these people. Uh, a detransitioned woman in Newcastle called Charlie Evans claims to be in touch with hundreds of them, uh, many of which are young women. The first legally non-binary man in the USA recently disavowed all forms of support of transgenderism. 
Uh, he now criticizes the trans movement and is actually thankful for the part Christians have played in speaking out against it as well. And also there are forums dedicated to supporting people regretting their sex change, and these communities seem to be swelling by the day. Sharon, I mentioned earlier the advice you were giving to parents about raising children in this gender fluid culture. What do you think are the most important considerations parents need to make when tackling this issue with their children? Well, if your child claims to be transgender, it's very, very important to consider that there may well be distress caused by a number of under, other underlying issues. So investigate to see what those may be. And also do remember that adolescents often experience rapidly shifting ideas and emotions. And you could empathise without affirming. And I'd urge you not to reinforce an idea that might otherwise pass over. And do be very, very cautious about who you look to for professional help. And always remember that there's a totally natural and safe way of resolving gender confusion in young people. And Michael's already referred to this. And that's just called puberty. When children do genuinely experience discontent with their biological sex, if puberty is allowed to take its natural course, you allow testosterone to kick in for boys, estrogen for girls, in the vast majority of cases, gender confusion is resolved. And so for that reason, I'd urge parents not to be pushed into encouraging social transition or into giving access to puberty blockers. Do remember that children and young people are impressionable and immature. We don't allow them to make big decisions in other areas. In many countries, they're not allowed to drink alcohol or smoke or get a tattoo until they're 18 or even older. And some experts would say that their brains are not fully wired up for mature forward thinking until they're 25. So in time, your child may thank you for resisting their demands. Obviously, uh, transgenderism is a, a very tricky subject to handle. So I just want to thank both of you for handling it as graciously and sensitively as you have done. I'll be revisiting the subject of transgenderism again in another podcast, focusing particularly on the world of education. But if you do have any burning questions, we have just produced a new briefing called Equipped for Equality, which talks about what schools can and can't do in the name of equality and human rights. And that includes thinking about how schools deal with gender ideology appropriately. In the meantime, Sharon and Michael, thank you so much for speaking to me today. And thank you to everyone listening. Goodbye.